Um, welcome everybody. Self-employed and self-determined um, is obviously a topic of interest to many because we have quite a lot of people signed up. So appreciate that. Um, feel free to pop in the chat where you're from, where you're joining us from. Um, always nice to see where you're coming from. With that, though, my great pleasure to actually introduce our speaker today. So Jonathan Martinez, he is the Senior Director for Law and Policy for the Burton Black Institute at Syracuse University, and he leads the efforts to ensure that older adults and people with disabilities have access to the services and supports they need to lead independent and inclusive lives. Jonathan's led supported decision-making projects all across the US has educated and trained tens of thousands of older adults, people with disabilities, families, professionals across the country on supported decision-making theory and practice. He's also written and co-written over 60 publications on supported decision-making, including the first textbook and first theory to practice guidebook on the subject. So thank you, Jonathan, for taking time to be with us today. I'm gonna turn it over to you um, and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nikki, and thank you everyone for joining us today. What we're going to talk about today is my favorite subject, um, what, what I think is the greatest advance in human and civil rights for people with disabilities since the Americans with Disabilities Act. We're going to spend roughly the next hour talking about supported decision making. Now, if you've heard about supported decision making, you've probably heard about it as an alternative to guardianship, something you can do instead of going into guardianship, something you can do to get out of guardianship. And that's true. And we're going to talk about that. But there's two things I think that are important that we understand from the beginning. Because while we are going to talk about supported decision making as an alternative to guardianship, I'm not here to tell you there should never be guardianships. That is not my intent. I'm not here to tell you that if you are a guardian, you're somehow evil. If you recommended guardianship, you did the wrong thing, etc. What we're here to talk about today are options. Options that may be able to improve people's lives, including help them become self-employed. And what I want to make sure we have happen today is that you have all of that information in front of you when it comes time, or if it ever comes time for you to make that difficult decision. So that's my first promise. My second promise is this, everything we talk about today will be backed by one of two things, law or science. We are not talking about aspirational goals or hippie trippy vaporware today. We are talking about time and scientifically tested methodologies that have been shown to improve the quality of life for people with disabilities. So with those two things in mind, let's begin. And let's begin by thinking about something that people don't think a whole lot about or, or don't have the opportunity to, and that's this, their rights. People don't really think about their rights. I know you know that you have rights, but I want you to really think about the ones that are important to you, the ones that make you feel the proudest, the strongest, the, the ones that you would fight to keep, the ones that make you truly feel like a citizen, an American, a human being with human rights. Is it something like freedom of speech or freedom of elections or freedom of religion or the right to or life? Your eligibility sheet, what the and other I, I, annual form? Uh, Nick, if you wouldn't mind muting everyone. Um, or is it the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Now, with that in mind, think about what all of those rights have in common. Think about what freedom of speech and freedom of election and freedom of uh, religion. Think about what all has in common. They all have choice in common. Every right we have comes down to choice. Everything that we do comes down to choice. Freedom of speech is the right to choose what to say and what not to say. Freedom of elections is the right to choose who will govern us. Freedom of religion is the right to choose how and where and even whether we will worship. That's what freedom of choice means. So if you ask me what my favorite right is, my favorite right is the right to make choices because choice makes everything we do possible. Choice makes everything we do real. Without choice, do we even have rights? And when you hear me talk about freedom of choice and the right to make choices, I'm going to throw a buzzword at you. I'm not a huge buzzword guy, but I want you to think about this one. It's called self-determination. In fact, it is in the title to this presentation today. What self-determination means is making choices. When people are self-determined, 
They do things instead of having things done to them. They make choices instead of having make people have people make choices for them. When people are self-determined, they are what is called the causal agent in their life. The people making things happen. The person making choices. So when you hear self-determined, I want you to think of it this way. People who are self-determined make more choices. And here's something we know. And we know this from 40 years of research. For people with disabilities, particularly people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, those who are more self-determined, those who make more choices have demonstrably better lives. We have seen from study after study after study going back to the 1980s that people with disabilities who are more self-determined are more likely to be healthy and independent, more likely to be involved in their communities, more likely to be healthier and safer. And here is something else that's incredibly important. And it could be, again, it gives us the title of this presentation. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities who have more self-determination are more likely to work. They are more likely to make more money. They are more likely to be involved in managing their money and their lives. So it is absolutely fair to say that based upon decades of studies, self-determination, making choices, is the key to a good quality of life for people with disabilities. But with that in mind, ask yourself another question. Those rights that are so important to you, freedom of speech and freedom of election and freedom of religion, are they worth anything if you're not allowed to use them? If I say to you, Nikki, you have freedom of speech, but you're only going to talk when I tell you to, and you're only going to say what I tell you to, or you have the right to vote, but you're only going to vote for who I tell you to, and that is only if I take you to the polls to vote. In those situations, are those rights? When you have your choice taken away, do you even have rights? Well, that is exactly what we have been doing to people with disabilities for about 1,500 years. Uh, quick confession for you. I am something of a legal geek. I say that with some pride. But what I can tell you is that in the Western legal tradition, the very first time all of the laws across an entire country or empire were put together in one place and harmonized was the Roman Empire about 1,500 years ago. An emperor named Justinian had all of the governors from all of the provinces get together and harmonize their laws so that the laws would be uniform from one part of the empire to the other. They put it into a book. That book is called the Justinian Code. I am such a geek that I, one, have a copy of that book, and two, named one of my sons Justin. What I can tell you is this, having read that book, the first time we had laws and rights that were harmonized, really the first time that we had enforceable rights, one of those laws said, if you are feeble-minded, and that was their word for people with disabilities, feeble-minded, you had to have someone over you making decisions for you. You had to have what they called a curator. And that began what I would call a culture or an expectation that anyone who shows any limitation or needs any help, it is expected that they will not be able to do things, that they should not be allowed to do things. And that expectation, that culture has followed us ever since. In the British Empire, which is where we got most of our laws, they updated Justinian in the Middle Ages. What they said is that if you are an idiot or a lunatic, and that was their word for people with disabilities, you had to have a committee over you to make decisions for you, to do the things for you, taking away your self-determination. And here in America, we just call that guardianship. Um, we call it guardianship. Some states call it conservatorship, so, many names. I'm going to use guardianship all the way through because here's the thing. Even though every state has their own laws, guardianship, conservatorship, they work basically the same in every state. If a judge decides that I cannot exercise some or all of my rights, what that judge is supposed to do is take away those rights that I truly cannot exercise, those things that I truly cannot do, and give them to someone else. Someone else then becomes my guardian. They get the power to do what I cannot, just what I cannot. And if guardianship worked that way, you'd have no bigger fan than me. In fact, I have nothing against guardianship when it's needed. My godson is in guardianship and thank God for it because my sister empowers him. But here is again what we know from studies. We know that even though guardianship is only supposed to be used to take away rights you truly cannot exercise, well over 90% of guardianships are what are called full or plenary and take away all rights. 
regardless of whether you are able to exercise them, regardless of what you want, regardless of what you can do, regardless of what your doctor says, as I've had judges tell me across this country, as long as you're allowed to take away all the rights to call it plenary guardianships, courts are going to prefer that because it's easier to check all the boxes than it is to figure out which ones to check. Does that mean guardianship is wrong? No, it means we have to be careful. Because when we take away rights that people don't need to lose, when we take away rights that people are able to exercise, bad things can happen. As these two journals have said, when you have a guardian, you have a third party, often a stranger, who has the power to decide what kind of life you have, even going into the most basic, personal, and intimate decisions, where you live, who you can date, whether you can work in the hands of a stranger. Imagine saying, I want to work. I want to have my own business. And someone saying, well, you're not gonna, simply because they have the power to do so. How would you feel? How would you feel if you knew that you could work, if you wanted to explore work and someone said, no, I'm not going to let you do that. And that kind of taking away of people's right to make choices, the removal of self-determination is harmful. We know from studies going back now to the 1970s that when people with disabilities lose their self-determination, when their choices are taken away, their lives get worse. One study found that people losing the right to make choices feel helpless and hopeless and self-critical. Another found that people who have less right to make choices feel more passive. They have lower self-esteem. They feel inadequate. They have less ability to do things. And that's not rocket science, is it? If I tell you time and time again, you cannot do something, are you feeling particularly motivated to try? Of course not. That is something that is called learned helplessness. That is something that has, has been documented where people told that they cannot do things will see it as a personal failure and then will not attempt new things because they don't want to fail at that too. That does not mean guardianship is bad or evil or wrong. It means you have to be careful before we put people in guardianship. We have to be careful and think whether that is the right thing to do. I mean, think about it from an employment standpoint. If you had someone in guardianship, if you're a bank and someone under guardianship comes in and is asking for a loan or to open up an account, would you let them? If they don't have the right to sign a contract or sign a check, would you be willing to give a person an account? Or would you be willing to write them a loan? If you were a business, would you be enter into a contract with another business whose president had no right to sign contracts? If you were an employee, would you work for someone who doesn't have the right to sign checks or has been found to be quote unquote incompetent? Of course you wouldn't. So that means we have to be extra careful when we are dealing with guardianship because if it's not right, people can get hurt by it. And that is something that we have known about for decades. Let me tell you this, problems and concerns about guardianships did not begin with free Britney. We have known since the 1980s of the danger of guardianship. What's on your screen is a quote from Congress. Congress did the first investigation into guardianships in 1989. So 30, almost five years ago. They talked to people under guardianship, talked to guardians, did research, looked at guardianship statutes. And what you're looking at on your screen is one of the first findings from the congressional report. Take a look at it with me. Look at the bold words. The typical ward person under guardianship has fewer rights than the typical convicted felon. And again, imagine being a person with disabilities and being told that people in jail have more rights than you do when you have done nothing wrong. When there are guardianships, particularly what I call overbroad and undue guardianships, guardianships that take away more rights than people need to lose, or guardians that take or guardianships that take away rights in the first place when people are able to exercise them. You have this other person, this guardian, often a stranger, who can decide things like where you live, what you do, what kind of life you lead, whether you work, what kind of health care you get. And as the Congress said, sometimes when you die. As they said, it is in one sentence, the most punitive civil penalty that can be levied against an American citizen. The rest of that sentence, short of the death penalty. So where do we go from here? I made you a promise when we began, I'm gonna keep it. I am not here to say there should never be guardianships. Absolutely not. Absolutely, there are times when guardianship is appropriate. When a person is so limited in their abilities that they cannot take part in the decision-making process, of course they need a guardian. 
when a person has limitations and does not wish to take part in the decision-making process and is putting his or her health at risk, of course, guardianship is appropriate. In emergency situations, when there is no one available to help, a temporary guardianship is a fantastic temporary solution. So I am not here to say there should never be guardianships. What I am here to say is there should never, never, never be guardianships just because you have X diagnosis or because you're Y years old or because you need help or the two on the bottom that frankly make me nervous and turn my stomach because I hear them so often. One, because that's the way it's always been. And two, for your own good. And I hear that one at the bottom across the country. It's for my son or my daughter, my mother, my brother, my family, whomever, their own good. If I do not get guardianship over this person, something bad might happen. They might make a bad decision. They might do something they shouldn't do or meet someone they shouldn't meet. They might sign something they shouldn't sign. Therefore, we need to have a guardian for this person's own good. And I never question people's motivations because while it is true that there are some guardianship abuse out there. I have found that 99, 98% of cases, it's just someone who means well, a mother or a father, a loved one who is looking out for someone they care about and who thinks that this is the only option. So that's why I hear it's for your own good and people mean well, but I've learned this and there's a quote up on your screen saying it. And that's, this quote is pushing hundred years old, by the way, from the US Supreme Court. And they said this, when we mean the most well, that is when we have to be the most careful. Because when we act without thinking, when we act with assumptions, bad things can happen. The greatest dangers to lib liberty lurk in the insidious encroachment by men of zeal who are well-meaning but without understanding. And now look, that's almost 100 years ago, and that was the Supreme Court. They didn't apparently know that women could have zeal, but they were just nine old white guys talking amongst themselves. We've come a little off bit since then, and we understand that everyone can have zeal. So consider that sentence meaning that people who mean well can do bad things when they don't understand the possible consequences, when they don't understand the 40 years of research that says taking away self-determination when it's not needed can cause real harm. And yet I still hear it for your own good. They might sign something they shouldn't sign or do something they shouldn't do or meet someone they shouldn't meet. And then I ask them to think about their lives. I, let's say I'm going to ask you, think about your life. Think about if you've ever closed on a mortgage or signed a lease. If you have, you've done what I've done. You've gone to a ceremony, they call it, where you get the papers and you sign the paperwork. And what is at that ceremony? If it's done real or whether it's done virtual, you have a stack of papers going up to the ceiling, real or PDF. They are theoretically this high. And one by one, they are given to you and you are told, sign here. And I ask, were you like me? Did you sign them without reading them first? Because if you were like me, and if you were like the majority of people, think about what you did. Think about what a horrible decision you just made. You just put hundreds of thousands of dollars of your money in 30 years of your life in the hands of a bank, and you did not read the fine print. What a horrible decision. I think you need a guardian. Or have you ever had surgery or had to consent to a medical procedure? I know I have. About eight years ago, I had my knee done. And let me tell you, I'm a huge baby when it comes to medical care. They wheel me into the surgery center and I am, my heart rate's jacked. I'm just hoping for Valium at that point. And what's happening is a bunch of strangers are getting up in my face speaking jargon. I'm your doctor, I'm your nurse, I'm your anesthesiologist, I'm this, I'm that. And what they all have are pieces of paper that they are shoving in front of my face and they are saying, sign here. Now, were you like me? And you sign them without reading them first? Because if you were like me, you did a horrible, dumb thing. You put your life in the hands of strangers. You probably signed away your right to sue and instead agreed to arbitration. And you didn't read the paperwork? You made a horrible decision. You need a guardian. And now here we are, thank God, I hope, coming out of almost four years of pandemic. And I wonder if any of you have played my favorite pandemic game, because yes, I had a favorite pandemic game that got me through the hard times of the pandemic. Let's see if you maybe did something similar. My game went like this. Have a bunch of drinks and see what shows up from Amazon. 
I gotta tell you, I could tell what kind of day I had by what prime delivered to me the next day. I knew if it was a pasta maker, I was stress eating. I knew if it was a useless piece of workout equipment, I was stress eating. Often I got the same at the same time. And if you did that, if you did retail therapy, what a horrible decision. You signed things you shouldn't have signed and ordered things you shouldn't have ordered and bought things you shouldn't have bought. You need guardians. And then I ask people this. Have you ever had a bad relationship that taught you what a good one is? Have you ever been a rescue buddy or been rescued by a buddy? Have you ever woken up after a really interesting night and said, wow, I'm never doing that again, but I'm kind of glad that I did because now I have a story I can tell. You use one of the cliches we use about the day after, right? It was a teachable moment. It was a life lesson. We all talk about those. Well, if you did that, doesn't that mean you did something stupid that you're not going to do again? Doesn't that mean when you dated the wrong person, you can't be trusted to have a good relationship and you shouldn't be allowed to date again? The answer is, of course not. Because the mistakes you made, the teachable moments, the bad relationships, the misjudgments, they taught you who you want to be and who you don't want to be. They taught you what to do and what not to do in the future. They shaped you. Our mistakes make us who we are. So when we say about people in our lives, they need a guardian for their own good, aren't we saying that they don't have the same right to grow that we do? Because let me tell you, your mistakes made you a better, stronger, smarter, more contributory member of society. If we take away that ability from people who could exercise it, from people who could benefit it, aren't we taking away people's right to be people? And I'll give you one more example. I want you all to think about the year 1995. And, and I'm sure there are people on this call who either weren't alive in 1995 or don't remember it because they were very young. We all hate you, everyone else. Everyone who is old enough to remember 1995, let's think about it and think about what life was like for people with disabilities in 1995. Because 1995 was only five years after the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed. It was four years before the U.S. Supreme Court rendered its decision in a case called Olmstead that said people with disabilities have the right to live in the community. That means in 1995, you had the absolute right to tell a person with disabilities you will live in an institution. It doesn't matter what you can do, what you can't do, what you want to do. If we want you to live in an institution, you will. That was 1995. 1995 sheltered workshops where people who were perfectly able to work were instead put to work for sub-minimum wage in places that only worked with people with disabilities, in secluded areas. They were the expectation. People would brag. You know, uh, vocational rehabilitation in schools would brag about the number of people they placed in a sheltered workshop. In 1995, we didn't have services and supports like we do now. We didn't have technology like we do now. 1995 wasn't that long ago. It's only 28, 29 years, right? Um, think about how far we've come. Sitting here at the dawn of 2024, we know that people with disabilities have a Supreme Court protected right to live amongst their fellow citizens. If they can live in the community and they want to live in the community, they should be empowered to live in the community, same as everyone else. Sitting here today in 2024, working in the community, paying regular taxes, making regular wages is an expectation. Someday, I hope to say it's a right. Sitting here today, we have supports and services and Medicaid waivers. We have technology. I mean, consider your phones. Consider your phones, the ones that I hope you're not playing with right now. But consider your phones and what you can do with them. You spend significantly more time on your phone not talking than you do talking. With your phone, you can refill prescriptions. With your phone, you can make an appointment and have a telemedicine appointment. And if you want to, you can conference in someone in to help the doctor understand you and you understand the doctor. With your phone, you can check your bank balance and balance your budget. And you can give someone else, if you want to, access to your bank records to help you budget your money. With your phone, you can set reminders to refill prescriptions. You can connect with people to help you access the things you need to do. Quick story, uh, I, I worked with a, a woman with a traumatic brain injury and diabetes. Um, she, when she suffered her brain injury, um, she began having difficulty managing her diabetes. 
and she had a couple of crashes. Um, she is exactly the kind of person who would be in an institution in 1995. But do you know what she has now? She has a free underline, free app. It connects her phone to her glucose monitor so that when her blood sugar is low, she gets a text, eat something. If it continues to get lower, her mother, her sister, and her doctor get texts so they can intervene. And just like that, for free, mind you, this person is able to live and work independently in the community. So what I'm trying to get at is right now in 2024, we have more ways to make more people more independent than ever before. And that is undeniable, right? We have more ways to help people do more things, to live better, to feel better, to act in a more integrated and inclusive way. But answer me this stupid question. How come the number of people with uh, under guardianship has tripled since 1995? tripled. In 1995, there was an estimated 500,000 people in guardianship. Today, that number ranges from 1.5 million to 1.7 million. And before you say it's because we're getting older, and believe me, every day I get up and something else aches or pains, I know we're getting older. What the National Council on Disability found is that the fastest growing segment of the population going into guardianship are 18-year-olds, 18, 18 to 24-year-olds with intellectual or developmental disabilities, because somebody meant well. Someone said, you have no choice. You have to get guardianship. You have to do this. And just like that, someone who, and an 18 and 24-year-old, has the best opportunity to learn things, someone who has a tremendous opportunity to learn and grow, has had their rights taken away, statistically speaking, all of their rights taken away for the rest of their lives. And the science is scary. We know that people under guardianship, particularly guardianships they don't need, can have a significant negative impact on their physical and mental health. They can live less long, do less well, feel less well, and function less well. On the other hand, we know from study after study after study that people with disabilities who have more self-determination have a better quality of life. They're more likely to be independent, parts of their community, more likely to work and earn more money. And the number one reason I hear for guardianship across this country, and I, I am fortunate to have gone across this country talking about this, is safety. Someone saying, if I don't get guardianship, my son or my daughter might be abused. And again, I never question a parent's motivation. I have two sons. My first motivation is to keep them safe. But what I do talk about when someone says I have to get guardianship for safety is science. There's a study up on your screen right now. It's part of a series of studies done by a professor named Ashita Kempka from Long Island University. What Dr. Kempka looked at was the link between self-determination and safety. And what she did was she worked with a cohort of women with intellectual disabilities. If you don't know this, you should. Women with intellectual disabilities are exponentially more likely to be abused or neglected than other segments of the population. More likely to be physically abused, mentally abused, sexually abused. It is horrible. So what Dr. Kemka did was she worked with women with intellectual disabilities. And I am not a scientist. So I call it an apples to apples study, meaning that everyone in that study had similar abilities and limitations. And what she did was a classic experiment. She divided them up and said to one half, go live your lives. And to the other half, she gave access to a curriculum designed to enhance self-determination, to teach them about decision-making, to give them opportunities to make decisions, to let them know they should make decisions. When that was done, she brought them back together and she gave them a test, a recognized vetted test designed to examine how well people can recognize potentially abusive situations and avoid them. And here's what she found. Apples to apples. Those with more self-determination were found to be across the board, better able to recognize abusive situations and avoid them. They were safer. And again, I say, is that rocket science? If you know something is yours, if you know it's your body, your life, your stuff, if you know that belongs to you, aren't you going to fight like hell when someone tries to take it away? So I've told judges and parents and professionals this across the country. If you want to keep people safe, don't take away their rights. Build their abilities. We have a this fallacy that if we just Take, you know, put people in guardianship, they'll be safe. Like it's Rapunzel in the tower. Like if we put her up there, she's not, she's going to be perfectly safe. Well, newsflash, Rapunzel got out. And for those of you who were born after 1995, that's the plot to the movie Tangled. But what happened is Rapunzel got out and she met someone. And when, if we take that as a given, 
if we take as a given that you cannot envelop someone in a bubble, that guardianship is neither a suit of armor nor a chastity belt, then shouldn't we be empowering people with the knowledge and skills to be safe as opposed to simply hoping that they'll be safe because they mm -hmm. won't go anywhere, do anything, or meet anyone? I know the one I would choose. So the other thing is this, and I call this the cherry on top of the Sunday. The National Core Indicator Study, which geek that I am, is my favorite study. The National Core Indicator Study was done in almost every state in this country. And what it is, is a examination of quality of life of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And again, it's an apples to apples study. They looked at even the old words, mild, moderate, and severe disabilities. So they compared the experiences of people with mild disabilities to others with mild disabilities, moderate, moderate, severe, severe. And what the entire point of this study was, was to look at the impact of certain things on quality of life. One of the things they looked at was whether or not a person had a guardian. And in every state this was done in, what was found was this. Apples to apples again, remember. People without guardians were more likely to work and make more money, more likely to live independently, more likely to have friends other than their family and staff, more likely to date and socialize in the community, and more likely to practice the religion of their choice. So when I talk to parents about this study, what I do is I put this slide up there and I say this, isn't this exactly what you want for your child? Or is if you are a professional, isn't this exactly what you would want for the people you work with? And if you knew that the one thing that could be standing in between having this and not having this was having a guardian. Doesn't it mean that we have to think about it first? That 1500 years since Justinian of reflexively assuming that people need guardianships are more than enough. And oh yeah, by the way, they did that study again a couple of years later and they found the same thing. A few years later, they found the exact same thing. Apples to apples. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities who did not have a guardian were more likely to have their own homes, their own jobs, more likely to be parts of the community, active parts, more likely to date and get married, more likely to be respected. They did it again more recently. They haven't published the results, but I know the people who did it, and spoiler alert, they found the same thing again. And it's not rocket science. They had more self-determination. They had more opportunities to make choices. They were able to make more choices and it translated to a better life. So where can we go from here? I've just spent 20 minutes and I hope you're not regretting being on this webinar, but I have just spent 20 minutes talking to you about the impact of self-determination on quality of life. So what I'm hoping that I've taught you is this, that self-determination is the key to a better quality of life and that the converse is true. Losing self-determination can make people's lives worse. Well, if we accept those two things, and I think we have to, 40 years of studies say so, there's one more thing we have to accept. And that's this, people need help. People need help. I mean, everyone needs help. You should have seen me trying to get on this webinar. I had to register. I had to figure out all these things. It took me forever to get on. But people with disabilities often need more or different help than other kinds of people. So self-determination is not you're on your own. Via con Dios, live your life. Absolutely not. Because people need help. So here's what I'm proposing to you after 20 minutes of this webinar, that what we need to do is find ways to maximize people with disabilities self-determination because that is the key to a better quality of life while at the same time making sure that they have access to the help they need to exercise their self-determination to make choices as effectively and safely as possible and we agree with that we can move forward because what I can talk to you about is supported decision-making. And yes, I know we are on slide 27 and I am finally getting to the point. But what supported decision-making is, is a way to enhance and empower both self-determination and help. If you want to know what supported decision-making is, there is a great definition on your screen. You can read it together. Supported decision-making is a recognized alternative to guardianship through which people with disabilities use friends, family members, and professionals to help them understand the situations and choices they face so they may make their own decisions without the need for a guardian. Google Scholar supported decision-making. You'll see those long words. It's in a textbook. It's in studies. I wrote it. So you have a chance to say that you're listening to the guy who wrote that definition. But if I have my druthers, I'd prefer you forget it because it's crap. This definition stinks. This definition is pseudo-intellectual, 
intellectually insecure crap. If you want to know what supported decision making is, ask yourself a question. How do you make decisions? What do you do when you don't know what to do? What do you do when you are faced with a situation you've never seen before? What do you do if the doctor is speaking jargon to you? What do you do if the auto mechanic is speaking jargon to you? What do you do if you're faced with a situation in your life at work or in a relationship that you've never seen before? What you do is you get help. When the doctor speaks jargon, if you're like me, you say, would you please explain that in plain language like I'm a three-year-old? If an auto mechanic is talking gibberish at me, I have a buddy who knows about cars and I ask him for his advice. When one of my children is getting in trouble on days that end in Y, I have a sister who is an educational professional who I seek out for advice. My other sister is a gerontologist who has been remarkably helpful now that my mom is getting older. So what I am getting at is this. Supported decision-making is nothing more and nothing less than getting the help you need to do the things you need to do to make the decisions you need to make. In other words, it's how we all live our lives. Every single one of us uses supported decision-making every single day. It's just that people without disabilities, and by the way, I call people without disabilities uh, TABs or temporarily able-bodied, because each and every one of us is one second, one slip, one fall, one diagnosis, one heart attack, one stroke, one bad driver away from having disabilities. So if you're a temporarily able-bodied person, understand this, you use supported decision-making every day. You don't call it that, but you call it making decisions. Think about all the cliches that we have about supported decision making. Don't make, don't go off half cocked. Don't make a snap judgment. Um, get a second opinion. My dad would always say, if you measure twice, you only need to cut once. They all mean the same thing. Get help. Get a second opinion. If you are a professional, you are judged on your job evaluation by how well you work with others, how well you collaborate, how well you seek assistance. So for people without disabilities, using supported decision making is a sign of wisdom. It is a sign that you are doing the right thing, that you are getting a second opinion. But for people with disabilities ever since Justinian, if someone has the gall to say, I don't understand, explain it to me. What's happened to them for 1,500 years is society has decided they can't do things. They can't make decisions, and therefore they should not be allowed to make decisions. And therefore we see all of the scientifically proven negative impacts of the loss of self-determination. So where can we go from here? Where can we take supported decision-making to use it to serve as an alternative, to help empower people, to help them reap the benefits, including enhanced employment that come with self-determination. Well, first things first, just about every state law says the same thing. They all say that if a person is incapacitated or incapable or unable to make decisions or that guardianship is necessary, it's always some word like that. People who are incapable or unable, incapacitated, incompetent, or guardianship is necessary to help them, or there are no less restrictive alternatives available, check your state law. It'll say something like that. Well, think about this. What does that mean? What does it mean to be capable? What does it mean to be able? What does it mean to be competent? And realize this, something that you already know. Being capable and competent and able is not a yes or no question. Because each and every one of us is competent, capable, and able in different ways at different times. You ever wake up one day not feeling well and say, man, I better not do anything important today. I'm not thinking straight. Ever been too close to an issue? And as my boss says, you have to get to 30,000 feet before you deal with it. Or have you, do you realize that what makes you capable, there are things that you can do right now that I can't. There are things that I can do right now that you can't. And there are things that none of us can do unless we get help. You want an example? Unless you are a medical professional, you're a doctor, you are a, a licensed practical nurse. Unless you are someone who is able to diagnose and treat and prescribe, you can't take care of your health care because you can't diagnose yourself. You can't prescribe yourself your own medication. That means you have to get help. You have to go to the doctor. You have to go to the professional. You have to go to the pharmacist. That is the person that empowers you to manage your health. Yes, of course, I have the capacity to take a pill. When I am not feeling well, I go to the doctor and I am a big baby. I bet on my knees. I kiss the doctor's ring. I say, please make me feel better. And the doctor writes me a script. And yeah, I am perfectly capable of taking that script. But let me tell you something. I have no idea what's in it. 
I do not know the difference between erythromycin and a Z pack. I don't know why the doctor prescribed one and not the other. And I am not reading that tiny fine print on the bottle. Does that mean I am incapacitated or incapable of taking care of my health? No, it means that I needed support from the doctor, from the pharmacist in order to exercise and take care of my health. So what I tell people is this, the smart questions. If you're talking about employment, if you're talking about self-employment, if you are only able to manage your business, if you are only capable to run and be self-employed, if you need help, are you incapacitated? That better not be a yes, because that would mean we're all incapacitated. Because if you're running a business, if you're self-employed, you need a ton of help. You may need an accountant. You may need a tax professional. You may need an attorney. You're certainly going to need employees. You need tons of help to manage your business. So if you are incapacitated just because you need help, my God, we all need guardians, which means that there is another question we have to ask. If you can manage your business, be self-employed, manage your financial decisions. When you get help, when you have someone helping you with the bank, when you have someone balancing a budget, is a guardian necessary? Of course not, because you're able to do the things you need to do with the help you need to do it, which means we have to ask the most important question. If you are considering guardianship, if you are thinking about whether a guardianship is appropriate or necessary, we have to ask this question. What else have you tried? What ha You cannot decide that 99% of the time, yes, a person in a coma needs a guardian, but 99% of the time, you cannot know if a person is incapacitated unless you have tried something to make them capable. So what have you tried? Have you tried supported decision-making? Have you tried other options? And I beg judges, and I have gone to judges across the country in cases and said, judge, how do we know? How can we sit here today and assume, given all of the services and all of the supports and all of the technology that we have now. What else have you tried? That's my dream is that there'll be a guardianship case where it's incontested because the person has no idea he or she has a right to fight it because the parents or someone has hired a lawyer and the lawyer wrote up the order. It's typical boilerplate language and gives it to the judge. And the judge says, wait a second, before I sign this, can you tell me what else you've tried? Because the law says we have to make sure it's necessary. How do you know it is? And that is not just my position. That is the position of the National Guardianship Association. The National Guardianship Association is made up of guardians by guardians for guardians. Their website is guardianship.org. They regulate guardians. They have a code of ethics for guardians. They train and certify guardians. There is nobody more invested in guardianship than the NGA. And this is what they say. Before guardianship, try something else. Try supported decision-making. It might work. It might not. And if it doesn't work, guardianship may well be appropriate. But what's the rush? Think about the rights that are so important to you, the ones that you would fight to keep. Aren't they worth slowing down for a second to see if the person could exercise them if they had some help? And here's the thing. Supported decision-making can do for people with disabilities precisely what it does for people without disabilities. It may be different methodologies. It may be different methods. But it is the same idea. Think about the way that you use supported decision-making when you go to a friend for help. Your friends help you narrow down your options. They help you get to 30,000 feet and see the forest for the trees. They help you do a pro or a con list or think about whether to make sure you're not acting emotionally rather than rationally. You can discuss with your friends. You can, I call it, war game with your friends and your family and your supporters so that when you make the decision, you are sure that the decision you're making is informed. It's your decision from all of the information you have before you. Now, you're probably thinking, because almost all of the people I talk to do, you're thinking, okay, we're, we're pushing 45 minutes in here. So hippie, get to the point. How do I do it? What's step one? What's step two? What's the book? What's the app? What do you do? And I've got good news for you. There isn't one. In fact, I've written two books on this subject. And if anyone ever says, this is the one and only way, if you do these three things, you're doing supported decision-making, run away. Because you already know the answer. You already know that you get support and use it differently than I do. There are things that you need support to do that are differently that I need support to do. So you need to find what works for you and the people you work with. Some people just need what I call a listening ear or shoulder to lean on, someone to bounce ideas off of. Some people like are like me. And they have what I call go-to people. 
I go to my one buddy for car questions. I go to another person for financial questions. I go to my sister on educational issues. And you can put that into a power of attorney or a support plan or a supported decision-making agreement, depending upon your state. You can do that and write it up and say that I will work with you to do this thing in this way. And some people like an even more specific kind called a micro board or circle of support. I can't see everyone on this call, but I got an email from an old friend of mine named Kish Pisani who piloted micro boards and circles of support. She said she'd be on today. So hi, Kish, I hope you're doing well. But they piloted the idea of a circle of support. Like a, think of a personal board of directors people you meet with, real or virtually, relatively regularly, and you talk to them. You bounce ideas off them, and you're hoping to spur debate. You're getting advice. You're getting discussion so that I can understand from them what my options are and choose the best one for me. And all of these are supported decision-making because all of them involve me going to you for support, you providing it, and me making the decision. In fact, I always say there's three commandments of, self, uh, of supported decision-making. If we can commit to these three things, we can all be advocates for supported decision making. We can all empower people to use it, to have their best possible lives. And let me tell you, spoiler alert, they're easy. And all of them are easier than the next. Number one, we all agree collectively that everyone has the right to make choices to the maximum of their abilities. That's easy. That's the Declaration of Independence, isn't it? We hold those truths to be self-evident, that we all have the right to life liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We have the right to make choices. Number two, I can go to you for help. I can ask you for advice. I can ask you for help making a decision without you saying you must not be able to make decisions. Therefore, you should lose your right. And that's easy because we do that every day. We get advice. We get assistance. We have conversations with people we care about every day. And third and last, there are as many ways to give and get support as there are people. The first thing you try may not work. You ever have to go to plan B, C, D, E, F, G? I often go to plan triple Q because the first thing you try to support someone might not work. It might not be the best way for them. Keep trying. Try another way. Talk, examine, explore because something might work. Nothing might work. If nothing works, guardianship is probably appropriate, but why rush? So here are some guidelines. Here are some thoughts on ways you can explore this. Remember, there's no one way to do this, but this is some ways that I have worked with people across the country on figuring out how to use supported decision-making and put it into action. So first, first thing you need to do is figure out where the person wants help. So the first thing you need to do is talk to the person. Where does this person need help? Where does this person want help? What kind of help has worked for this person? There's a great tool there's a link up on your screen, or you can find it by Googling it, called the Missouri Stoplight Tool. What the Missouri Stoplight Tool does is it looks at common everyday decisions. Working with the doctor, taking medication, getting to work, managing transportation, managing relationships. And it asks a question. Is this something, and the picture didn't come up, is this something that a person can do on their own? And if so, that is a green light. Go ahead and do it. Is this a thing the person needs help to do? A yellow light, explore it. And is this something a person simply cannot do? A red light. So what I do is I look at the gorillas and the reds. I ask people where this are, and I do it with them and a couple of people in their lives to kind of triangulate where the yellows and the reds are, because that tells us where the help is needed. And once you understand where help is needed, the next question is what kind of help is needed? And here's a spoiler alert too. I guarantee you just about everyone has used supported decision-making for something. At some point, someone has gone to someone else for advice about something, something as simple about what to wear that day, as complex as what, where to work but you talk to them about it. And there's a resource called the Supported Decision-Making Brainstorming Guide, which is designed to help people explore where they may have used supported decision-making before. What kind of decisions have you made? What worked well? What doesn't work well? What might work well? You know what a great example of supported decision-making is? You ever been to the emergency room? If you go to the emergency room, you will always see on a wall pictures of faces that are designed to help you point to how you feel. They go from smiling to in great pain to indicate your level of distress. That is an example of supported decision-making because it allows people to communicate when they might be in too much distress to do so. 
Maybe a person likes to communicate pictorially. Maybe they like to have things written out, written out for them. Maybe they like to have people explain things orally. Maybe they like extra time to think. That's the point of the brainstorming guide is exploring things and exploring options the way they've done before. Third, once you know that a person wants help in a certain place and the kind of help they want, next thing you need to know is who. Who can help you? Who is in that person's life? Who has worked with that person before? Who could work with that person? Are there professional agencies? Things like vocational rehabilitation, which we're going to talk about in our next webinar in a couple of weeks. Special education, centers for independent living, Medicaid waivers, professionals who can help. Are there family members and friends and others who can help? Who could provide that assistance? And once you have that, once you know where a person needs help, what kind of help they want, who can provide it, Put it all together. Make a plan. And one of my favorite resources is called the Setting the Wheels in Motion Guide. What the Setting the Wheels in Motion Guide did, it was written by a friend of mine, a mom and an advocate, by the way, who has three children with what we used to call severe and profound disabilities. And what she does in the entire first part is talk about her supported decision-making journey with them, how she put together teams, how she worked with them. But the entire second part, what I love, is worksheets. Ways to help you guide through a plan. Think about who can help, how they can help, where they can help, and what kind of help you want. So at the end of the worksheets, you have a plan. You have a plan. You have a roster of people. You have work being done. You have opportunities. So that plan is something you can put in motion. And the last thing I always recommend is put it in writing. Um, depending upon what state you're in, some states have laws recognizing supported decision-making, and some require that there be supported decision-making agreements in writing. If you're in one of those states, absolutely do put it in writing. If you're not, I like putting things in writing anyway. A power of attorney is a great way to include supported decision-making. But even if not that, it's a great way just to have stuff. Think about it. People like stuff. Professionals and doctors and lawyers and agents and others like stuff. They like being able to say, this is how I make decisions here. Here is my plan. And therefore, Jonathan is going to be supporting me. You need to talk with Jonathan too, as much as me. And there are great examples of written plans uh, at the National Resource Center for Supported Decision Making, supporteddecisionmaking.org. Or you could just do it as easily, for example, as making a roster. I worked with a young woman in California the first person in California to get out of a guardianship because she uses supported decision-making. And our supported decision-making plan was just a roster. It just said who was on Marie's team and what they did. Jonathan Martinez assists with legal issues. Another, her aunt assisted with relationship issues so that we could show that there was a working functioning plan in place. I once worked with someone who came into me, and this is in Virginia, and she came into my office after we worked with her on supported decision making, and she gave me a chart, a handwritten chart, where she said this, this says who I want to help me, this says when I want them to help me, this says how I want them to help me, and she said, that's it, and I said, my God, that is it, it's as simple as that, that's how we make decisions, we figure out what we need to do, and who can help us do it, and how they'll help us, and when we do that, we have supported decision making. And the reason that is important, and the reason why I spent the first 20 minutes of this presentation talking about self determination being the key to quality of life for people with disabilities is this the studies are coming in. I'm part of a bunch of them that are showing that when people use supported decision making, they have more self determination. And pardon me for being repetitive, but that's not rocket science either. If I am making my own decision with assistance from you, of course, I have more control over my life than if you were making the decisions for me. And what we know is that when I have more control over my life, my life is better, including I am more likely to work. I am more likely to make more money. I am more likely to be self-employed. And research has shown that time and again. In Virginia, we did a pilot project working with young adults. And what we found was those that used supported decision-making, they said that they were more independent, more confident, and they felt better about how they made decisions. Their supporters said they made objectively better decisions. And even in the middle of the pandemic, they were saying they were doing more things, working more ways, and being more active. It's not rocket science. They were more self-determined. They had more opportunities. And opportunities to use supported decision-making are all around us. If you think about it, if, you're a if you've ever been involved in special education, gone to an IEP meeting, you know that the gold standard is what's called the student-led IEP. 
which is as the student gets older, the student plays a lead role on the team. The student works with the team members, his supporters, her supporters, family, friends, you know, the administrator, the teacher, the regular ed teacher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they work together to help create the IEP. So that by the time the student is 18, the hope is that the student is really playing the lead role on the team and the student can sign off on the IEP. Doesn't that sound like supported decision making? The team and the person work together to support and the person decides. Any of you who've ever worked in vocational rehabilitation, the informed choice process is all about the counselor working with the person so that the person understands his or her options. The counselor provides information about services and supports and uh, opportune jobs and opportunities to get the training you need so that the person can then then decide what their job goal is and what they need to get there. Doesn't that sound like supported decision making? If you ever worked in Medicaid, person-centered planning is all about a team led by a case manager working with the person to help the person understand where they are now and where they want to be, who they want in their lives now and who they want in their lives later, the things they want to do now and later, their goals, their objectives, their supports, their services. Doesn't that sound like supported decision making? And even end of life planning, things like the conversation and what's called five wishes, they're an iterative conversational guide designed to help people say what they want when they reach the end of their journey. Supported decision making. All of these are giving people power in their lives, giving people opportunities in their lives. And what we know is that when they have more opportunities, when they have more control, their lives are simply better. Now, look, I know some of you are probably thinking this. What about safety? What um, I call it the elephant in the room. Someone always asks me, well, Jonathan, if we do supported decision making and not guardianship, are you sure my son, my daughter, my family, my friends, whoever will not get taken advantage of that they'll be safe? And my answer is no, of course not. In fact, I'm sure the opposite is true. I am sure that right now, someone with or without a disability is being led astray by someone they trust. But is that really the standard we should be applying? Because if you are only allowed to make decisions, if you only make good ones and you only have the best possible friends, then my God, I can never play poker with my friends because they get me to do all kinds of ridiculous things. We cannot condition our lives and our decisions on what I call the Spock standard. You only make good and logical decisions because if that's our standard, look in a mirror. I sure as hell hope you don't drink beer. And I hope you don't eat cookies. And I hope you don't lie in the sun because doing those things, I hope you don't blow off work sometimes, take a mental health day. Those are not logical decisions. They go against your best interests, except they don't. Those are the things that make us who we are. Those little quote unquote mistakes shape us, define us and help us be the self-determined people we are. And oh, by the way, there has never been a study that has found that people are inherently safe under guardianship. In fact, as I told you, there are horrific stories of guardianship abuse. This doesn't mean guardianship is bad. It means that some people are bad and people are going to be bad. But what I said is that we can empower people with disabilities to recognize potential abuse, just like Dr. Kempka found. So if you're going to give me a choice between supportive decision making and guardianship and say there's a chance of being hurt in both of those, Man, the one I'm trying first is the one correlated with self-determination because that is directly correlated with enhanced safety. Why wouldn't we try that first? And if we do, if we respect and protect choice, amazing things can happen. 10 years ago, I had the incredible good fortune to work with a young woman named Jenny Hatch, who was the first person to win her right to make decisions instead of being put in a guardianship using supported decision-making. The first person who went to trial, who walked into a tiny courtroom in a tiny town called Newport News, Virginia, and won her rights back, even though she had lost them a year before because someone decided that a person with Down syndrome can't make their own decisions. She showed she could. There are people across the country. This is Ryan King. Ryan was the first person in Washington, DC. He had been in guardianship for 15 years. His parents never wanted to be his guardians. In fact, they told the school, we, we don't want to be his guardians. The school said, if you want him to get services, you have to be his guardians. So what's a parent to do? They became guardians. About 10 years later, they um, said, this is dumb. Ryan can make decisions and we might predecease him. And by the way, that is a smart comment because this is the first, this is the first generation of people with disabilities who are statistically likely to outlive their parents. And they didn't want a stranger over Ryan. So they said, couldn't we do a power of attorney? Couldn't we do a plan? And you know what the judge said? 
Judd said, if you don't want to be his guardians, we'll find someone else. So what's parents do? They stayed as guardians. A few years later, Jenny happened and it made a lot of news. And they thought to themselves, this is what we do. So they tracked me down. So we spent the better part of a year creating a plan for Ryan and went right back to that judge and showed the judge that Ryan had a plan in place. He was going to work with his family. He was going to do this. He was going to have systems set up to keep him safe and keep himself determined. And what I remember is um, after that trial, uh, the, we had a power of attorney all set up that, and said, judge, if you get rid of the guardianship, he'll sign this right now. And the judge looked at Ryan and he said, Ryan, um, your attorney, me, uh, says that you'll sign this if I get rid of your guardianship. And Ryan said, yes, sir, I will. And then the judge smiled and he said, you can sign it if you want. That's your decision. And he ended the guardianship. And that is Ryan signing his power of attorney with his mom next to him. His mom is now his primary supporter. And Ryan and his mom have testified before Congress. They have lectured nationally and they have written articles all about what uh, his mom calls Ryan's journey of supported decision-making. This is Tanya a person who had a brain injury. Uh, when Tanya had her brain injury, she went into a coma and her mother did the right thing. Her mother became her guardian. But as Tanya began to get her faculties back, she wanted her rights back. And her mom pushed back because her mom wanted to protect her. So they went to court and the judge from Ryan's case called me in and said, they are depleting all of their money this sounds like a possible supported decision-making case. So I worked with this family for about a day and discovered they wanted the same thing. Tanya wanted her rights back, but wanted her mom there to help when she needed it. The mom wanted Tanya to be as independent as possible, but wanted to be able to step in if Tanya needed it. And just like that, we created the power of attorney so that Tanya now lives and works independently and her mom can help her when she needs it. These are things that happen across the country. Day after day, someone is freed from guardianship or avoids guardianship because of supporting decision-making. I told you Jenny Hatch's case was 10 years ago. In just those 10 years, 26 United States states and the District of Columbia have changed their laws to recognize supported decision-making. More than half of the country now has a law formally recognizing people's right to use supported decision-making. And I have been in court in several states that don't have laws, and we have won people's right to use supported decision-making. Why? One, because they can, and two, because we can prove it can make people's lives better. So that is the message I want to take to you. If you want to make people's lives better, if you want to help people be more likely to be employed, if you want to help people be more likely to be independent, if you want to help people be living and working and loving independently, then the place we have to start is respecting, protecting, acknowledging people's right to make choices, that we all have that right. And we have to realize that I know it's different. I know that we're doing different things when we do that. You're probably thinking the same thing I hear all the time. Well, we don't do it that way. I get what I call the finger wag. You know, you're asking us to change the way we always do things. I get that a lot from state agencies. I get that a lot in litigation. We can't do this because we've always done it this way. And my answer is this, and this is what I want you to think about. Hasn't every great advance in human and civil rights begun by changing the way things have always been? I live in Virginia. I'm talking to you today from Florida. And where I am sitting right now, in 1863, some people thought it was okay to own other people. We changed that. In 1918, half the population, women, were not allowed to vote. That was changed. In 1963, people would... It was legal to keep people from using bathrooms or sitting at lunch counters because of the color of their skin. And then we changed that. And in 1989, people with disabilities were not considered in a legal sense to be people. We changed it. So to say that we've always done guardianship the same way to, since Justinian is to say that we shouldn't grow, is to say that we shouldn't do things in new ways, that we shouldn't empower people. We can do better. And I know it's hard. I know it can be hard to change the way things have always done. And I know history pushes back because if you empower people to make decisions, guess what? Some of them are going to make bad ones. People are going to make mistakes. They're going to date the wrong people. They're going to buy the wrong things. They're going to sign things they shouldn't sign. My God, I do that at least once a week. But we have to realize that it's supposed to be hard. Being a human is hard. It's not easy. If you're a professional in this field, did you get into this field because it's easy? You sure as hell didn't get into it for the money. 
You got in it to make people's lives better. And if you know that self-determination makes people's lives better, then that's what you believe in. And that's what we must do. And it's not supposed to be easy. It's a quote up on your screen from my favorite author. And he says this, we were not promised that it would be easy. We weren't promised ease. The purpose of life is not ease. The purpose of life is to choose and to act upon the choice. When we do that, when we respect choice and we empower choice and we protect choice, when we give people the right to make choices, then we're not judged by one mistake. Because if we were judged by one mistake, none of us would have rights. No, what we are judged by are three things, our daring, our effort, and our resolve. And that's what it takes. You got to be bold and try new things. You have got to work really hard and you have got to be willing to get up when you fall down because you are going to get knocked down. People with disabilities get knocked down every day and you know that well and they get up and you've got to be willing to bang your head against the wall because sometimes that's the only way to knock it down and let the light in. And if we do that, we change the world. I have been talking at you for an hour. Let me finish with a cliche. We can change the world. We change it one person at a time. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Jenny Hatch took a year of trial and six days and she won her rights back. Ryan King took a year of preparation and one day in court. Other cases go to court on an agreement because people understand it's done. Most supported decision-making never even goes to court now. Why? We know it works. So when we empower one person, what we are doing is empowering everyone that comes after that. Remember what we did for Jonathan? Why don't we try that for Andrea? We can do something great for someone. Remember what? Remember when we tried something new? We knew it worked. Why don't we try it again? And that's how the world changes. One person making one decision at a time. And let me tell you this, man. The other reason we should be doing this is because the services and supports facing people with disabilities end. School ends. Special education ends. Work ends. Vocational rehabilitation ends. Medicaid waivers may end. Social security may end. What is left at the end of the day is the person, not the person with a disability, the person. And what we are doing then is empowering people, not people with disabilities using supported decision making, but people making decisions and getting what they need to live their best lives. The last thing I'm going to say is this. If you've bought into what I've told you for the last hour, and I'm happy to answer questions about it for the rest of the time, but if you have bought into this, then we can work together to change the way things have always been, to empower people to have that best life, to change the world one person and one decision at a time. And if you haven't bought in, I just hope you die suddenly. And that's not a joke. I, my fondest wish for you is if you don't believe in supported decision-making, I hope you die suddenly. And you know why? Because if you're not lucky enough to die suddenly, guess what you're going to be one day? You're going to be old. You're going to be infirm. You're going to be disabled. You're going to be in the system. What kind of system do you want to be in? Do you want to be in a system that empowers you, that respects your rights, that helps you build your abilities? Or do you want to be in one that's 1,500 years since Justinian says you need help doing something? We're not going to let you do anything. I think I know the answer. So for yourselves for the people you care about, for the rights you believe in, and for the people you want to support. We can use supported decision-making to make their lives better and change the world. It has been my pleasure to talk to you today. That is my email address on your screen. And I'm happy to answer any questions, but I also recognize that sometimes the questions come later. So if you think of something that you would have liked to have asked, you can email me right there and we can talk. But for now, let's take some time and talk. What kind of questions can I answer? Uh, Nikki, oh, sorry, yeah, I was mute. I was muted. I was talking away, but muted. Um, thank you, Jonathan, so much. Um, you mentioned it a couple of times, but it bears reminding ourselves that yes, as we age, um, we too will have more disabilities. Um, okay, so let me see. Um, I've got a question here. Can you provide some suggestions for financial protections while maintaining? autonomy. Absolutely. One of my favorite is the power of attorney. I hear all the time. And the, the number two reason I hear for guardianship after safety is financial management. And it's a, it's a absolutely 
real and appropriate concern. So I talk to people about powers of attorney. You can use those. And why I like powers of attorney is they're voluntary. With a POA, I can give you, Nikki, the right to make financial decisions for me. But we can also agree how you're going to do it. Um, I worked with a young man with autism once, and, and his mom was primarily afraid that he would be swindled, that he didn't have a good head for finances. And the kid was pretty self-aware. He said, yeah, you know what? I think so. So we worked to do a power of attorney that essentially said this, that for X dollars a month, give him an allowance, go nuts, spend money, learn how to make decisions, make mistakes, anything over that mom had to sign off on. But before mom said yes or no, they had to have a conversation because kid may have been right. And if so, he advocates for himself and mom signs off. The kid might be wrong. And if he's wrong, then mom can work with him on why and how to do it better. Like if the kid wants to buy a car, instead of just saying, nope, we're not doing that, mom can say, no, a car costs this much and you have to have this much money for insurance and this much for maintenance. So why don't we make a budget? You get a job, you put away this much per month, and there's going to be a time when you can do it. So just like that, instead of a yes or no question, and guardianship is largely a yes or no question, we can create a safeguard. There are lots of other tools. I am a big fan of ABLE accounts. ABLE accounts can help people work and earn money and save money without losing their benefits. But what they can also do, because the person who holds the account, the person with disabilities, is charged to manage that account, to decide how much to put in, how much to take out, and when, that's a great opportunity for supported decision making to give person access to maybe look at records and balance budgets and talk together so that you might be able to create a decision making process in that way. Supported decision making works great, as we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks with vocational rehabilitation, helping people learn to work and manage their benefits and manage their money. So there's lots and lots of ways. Uh, I am happy to talk about it offline because it just goes well beyond the time we have. But SDM is tailor-made for financial decisions. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, Teresa Christian has raised um, their hand. So Teresa, did you want to come off mute and ask your question? Or if you need to be using ASL, you can turn your camera on. Lisa, are you, let me click ask to unmute, maybe that's. Okay, um, I'm not sure. Um, also, a few people have come on camera. I don't know if that means that you're wanting to ask a question. Um, Ronald or Dara, do you have, did you have a question? Is that why you're on camera? No, okay. All right, just checking. Um, yeah. And let's see. Oh, who is the author of the brainstorming guide? Is uh, one question. That was written jointly between the American Civil Liberties Union and the Quality Trust for Individuals with Disabilities, who was the lead partner in the National Resource Center for Supported Decision Making. Um, I wrote it with people from the ACLU. Um, someone just asked me to read out my email address. Happy to, ma'am. It is J as in Jonathan, G as in Gerald, Martinez as in more than one martini, LLC at gmail.com. J G Martinez, M A R T I N I S, LLC at gmail. Okay. We have another one here. If I feel like the support brokers in my child's life need help in understanding SDM, how do I advocate for the school and government agencies to get much needed training? I will Lots never stop advocating uh, why we need to build the capacity. Yeah, I guess there's more, but I think that was the main question. There are lots of good resources out there you can share. Um, and again, please forgive me for sounding like I'm patting myself on the back, but there's lots of good stuff that I've been part of writing. The Missouri Developmental Disabilities Council, and you can Google Missouri DD Council, has a series of short, easy to understand brochures that are designed to give background information 
on supported decision making and applications of it. They're all about five to seven pages long, meaning they are long enough to give good information uh, and not long enough to get boring. And they have other resources to go to. So I strongly recommend those. It's like there's one on essentially what we just talked about today. There's another on using supported decision making in special education, another on using it in vocational rehabilitation, another on using it in healthcare so that there are opportunities using supported decision-making to help people and help organizations learn about and build systems. Okay, um, how might this supported decision-making apply for entrepreneurs, um, wannabes like me with disabilities? Um, and then, yeah, so that's basically the question. So first, you're not a wannabe, you are already an entrepreneur. Anybody <laughs> who makes the decision that they want to do this is this. So understand you've already taken the most important first step, which is you decided you wanted to do it. Now, with regard to supported decision making, there are tons of ways it can help you. Um, one of the great things you can do, again, talking about this in a couple of weeks, is working with your state's vocational rehabilitation system to help learn about and access supports and service to help you to be self-employed, to help you be an entrepreneur. And you use supported decision-making throughout that process. They call it informed choice, working with your counselor to understand things. If you have a Medicaid waiver or you work with a center for independent living, it's an opportunity to get support to understand your options and make decisions. What I want you to do, and, and I know it's um, one of the reasons why I don't, I've become less enamored of the phrase supported decision making is it sounds like a program or a project. But in actuality, it's just life. It's just getting information and making decisions. So everyone you work with is an opportunity to use supported decision making simply by saying, I want your help. I want you to help me understand and do the things I need to do. It is an absolute paradigm shift from the way that it's always been done but it is the right thing to do. And the studies back that up. So here's my advice. You go to the people you know, to the people you work with and say, this is how I want to do things. I would like you, potential supporter, to help me. I would like you, agency, bank, lawyer, whoever, to work with me with my supporter. You're setting up a system that is really no different from the systems everyone else has. The only difference is you're a person with disabilities and society hasn't thought you can do it. You can show them that people can. Kind of speaks a little bit to answering the next question, but what do you suggest for people with unsupported families and few friends? Well, that's the, the American Bar Association calls people uh, unbefriended, and it's a very sad situation. Part of that involves working with people you can work with. Um, every community has what's called a center for independent living that you can reach out to to request assistance in all kinds of things. You can try to build your circle. Going to organizations that work with people with disabilities and saying that I want to take these next steps and I'm looking for people to help me. That's how you do it. You build your circle. And if people don't want to be in your circle, then you either help them understand that they should be, or you simply say, okay, I'm going to leave you behind. I'll, I'll be back when we can still be friends. We can still be family members. I can still love you. Um, but I'm going to move ahead and manage my own life this way. Um, so somebody, there's a couple of people that have put their information in the chat. Someone from um, Iowa Vocational Rehabilitation has their email in there if you're in Iowa. Um, you did already say out loud your email, didn't you, Jonathan? I did, and I put it in the chat box. I'm going to put it in again because I know lots of people have been talking, uh, and I think that's great. I love that we are having conversation, and that's the other advice I can give you. Find people to have conversations with. Find your people. That's the great thing that the internet gives us, the opportunity to have conversations like this, exchange information. People on this call have probably experienced what you're going through right now. So it's a chance to network with people who've done it. It's a chance to build your group. So take opportunities to build your circle wherever you can. This is a great opportunity. Please reach out to me or reach out to some of the other folks. Yeah, and just in case we missed it, because somebody specifically needed it verbally, um, J G. 
M A R T I N I S. So that's J G Martinez LLC at gmail.com. Works if you still need it again, let me know. Um, okay, so balancing supported decision making versus guardianship for medical, especially in life, death. Um, possible situations due to expected surgical, et cetera. What resources do you recommend? Powers of attorney, absolutely, or advanced directives. Um, and again, there is a real difference between a power of attorney, advanced directive, and guardianship. In guardianship, Nikki, you just get the right to tell me what to do. In a POA or an advanced directive, we work together on what to do. I have done many advanced directives around healthcare where we say, maybe ultimately, Nikki, you do get to decide what to do, but here's how you're going to do it. You're going to ask me first. I'm going to give you certain decisions I will never agree with. I will never consent to electroconvulsive therapy. I will never consent to taking Haldol. And you, with those parameters, how we can create our decision-making method in an emergency, Nikki, you have the power to make that decision, but we go through a specific process in how to make it. In, in the case of Tanya, the person I told you about, we wrote a very detailed power of attorney that basically wrote out certain decisions. And we said the mom, who was the POA, her job was to make the decision Tanya would have made, not the one that mom thought was necessarily was the right one. So we had a whole bunch of decisions about that. So you can create a cooperative team, even if you are giving someone else power to make decisions um, at the end of the day. Okay, um, we're gonna run out of time and I wanna make sure that everybody knows that we will be sending out PowerPoint and we also have a guide that um, Jonathan wrote. Um, I'm not sure if we did put a link to that in the chat, but if not, we can do that now. But we will also be emailing it out to everybody that is on the call. Um, and Jonathan has alluded to the follow-up um, uh, next, you know, the next episode, next, next episode, <laughs> the next in the series, which is January 31st. It is the second part. And we will actually, for that, be having a panel of a couple of um, families who've, who've used supported decision-making, who have found that successful. So you'll be able to hear directly from them. Um, we do have one more quick question. What would you say to a young person who doesn't want to have a guardian, but is being told that he or she needs to because that's the way it is? Um, I would say, what do you think when you hear that? Do you think that you can make your own decisions? Are there ways in your life that you can have that done? Are there ways that you can work with other people to have the best possible life in your heart of hearts and in your brain? Do you know that you are capable of directing your own life? If the answer to those questions is yes, then when someone tells you that you have to have a guardian or need to have a guardian, especially because that's the way it's always been, frankly, I would tell them to go to hell. Simple as that. <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, the, there you have the, it. And by the way, I, I, I had much stronger language in mind, but I decided this is being recorded and I thought that'd be more colloquial. But really, to whoever said that, it's your life. You have the opportunity to build that life. That's what self-determination is. And to have someone else based on 1500 years of outmoded thinking telling you that you had no choice. Yeah, I would just say go to hell. You can do better. And this world will be better when you do better. Thank you all so much. It's been my honor to be here today. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all in a couple of weeks. Uh, you're getting a lot of um, praise in the, in the chat and appreciation for what you've been talking about today. Um, we did also have somebody who was asking for support with their small business. So Lexi, can you put our um link to the NDI supports um, for small business. National Disability Institute does have small business hub website. Um, Lexi just put it in there. Uh, we have a multitude of supports and services if you are an entrepreneur and you are looking for small business. And um, Ruth just put her email in the chat. 
which is R Chavez, C H A V E Z, at NDI INC.org. Um, she's actually our navigator and person who does one on one business counseling. Uh, we'll send all that information out to you, though, so you'll have it in writing in an email. Um, so let's see. Yep, everybody is saying great presentation, Jonathan. Um, you have got a, a link here to register for upcoming events, one to join the National Disability Institute mailing list. And also we do have a streaming television channel that is specifically geared towards individuals with disabilities who are entrepreneurs and small business owners. So check that out as well. All right, well, we are just about at the end of our time. I don't see any of, I'm trying to scroll. Let's see if, I, if there's any other questions. I don't see any, we have about two minutes left, but um, any parting words, Jonathan, before we say goodbye to everyone? Self-determination is the key to life for people with disabilities and without disabilities. Just by being here today, you made a commitment for yourself and the people in your life. If you heard things that inspired you today, if you learned things that can help you in your life today, the best thing you can do is one, do them, and two, tell people about them. You're all now ambassadors. Every single person who believes that something I said was correct now has, in my mind, a moral obligation to spread that word because there are people out there who haven't heard of it. And supported decision-making is natural. It's thing people can do. They don't need to be on a webinar like this. What they need are ambassadors and advocates to tell them to empower them. Each and every one of you is now one of those. That's how we change the world. And I will be honored to do it with you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks everyone for joining and be looking for those emails to get all the information, transcript and links. Thanks again, Jonathan. Have a great night.